Gary, do not sing that before I have to get up and preach anymore. I'm out of breath for a start. Good song. I like those basses over here. Morning, Mitch and Sonia. I like those basses. You actually sounded good. <laughs> now, the great thing is, I wonder how God thinks we sound because He is interested in spirit and in truth. But do you see two things here? As we worship God from the heart, in spirit and in truth, do you see why these assemblies are also called assemblies of exhortation? Because we worship together. I'll mention some about that more in the sermon as we go through. Last week, we asked the question, what does the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride or vainglory of life uh, mean? What do they mean? We learned they are not of the Father, that they are of the world, that they are the channels through which Satan strives to get us to break God's law, 1 John 3 and verse 4, John 4, 17. We realize that these appetites that are peculiar to this world will end when this world is over and that these particular desires are needful in this world. But they must be governed by the will of heaven and since we're free moral agents, we must allow God's will to govern us. Thus, we seek to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. We seek to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us, Matthew 6, 33. This is peculiar to the Lord's church wherever the Lord's church is faithful, whether it was 100 years ago, whether it was 1,000 years ago, or in the first century when the New Testament was being written. It will always characterize the church, and we must remember that. That doesn't mean there aren't members who fall away. That's true as you read your New Testament, that members cease to live as God says he wants them to live. But it doesn't change the truth. I wish people would learn that because certain people do not live up to the truth does not mean the truth is bad. Judas Iscariot couldn't be a worse character. His selling Jesus out did not mean Jesus was not the Son of God. The reflection was upon Judas Iscariot. Peter denying Christ did not mean that Christ would deny himself. John tells us he cannot deny himself. It didn't change who he was, what he came to do. It doesn't change the truth. Because truth is absolute and objective. It corresponds with reality. We've talked about that a lot in this congregation and wherever I've had the opportunity to preach and teach. But in general, our society is permeated with and steeped in what we have come to hear much of, secularism, pluralism, Emotionalism, of course, that's been around for a long time. But uh, a couple of these cause us then to be relativist or be subjective. Do you realize that if you removed emotionalism out of what most people call Christianity, you destroy it from their perspective. It's a false perspective. It's a twisted perspective. It's not a New Testament view, but that's their view. You have people to this very day who come into an assembly if they see fit to come at all. But they come into an assembly, there is called a worship assembly, and I'm not just speaking of the church, but it's certainly among the churches of Christ. And they've had a bad week. Of course, they don't realize they haven't prayed. They haven't studied the Bible. They've done everything their fellow worldly people who know not Christ have done, and they can't figure out why they're troubled. Then they come into a worship assembly, and they want a pep rally. They want their 
bowl of sugar so they can get up. Of course, that works while they're there, maybe a little while after it's over, but when the sugar high is gone, because there's no substance, they live on some plane other than thus saith the Lord. Then they're right back in the midst they were in, because they really never got out of it. They were just emotionally worked up. Now when you add to that the secularism, the pluralism, and no absolute objective truth, so everything's relative to the person. I heard Oprah this past week, and she said to Megan and Harry, Harry, did the palace hear your truth? Well, I don't care who's doing what about all that mess in the first place, except I wish even they would know the truth and be saved. But there is no your truth. There's no your truth at all. It's the truth. If I were to ask uh, Josh, what's, uh, what's your truth about this microphone? What would you tell me? Well, it's a uh, strawberry sucker. That's what I identify microphones with. Well, I might identify Josh in my mind with the strawberry sucker if he really thought that. <laughs> now, do you see immediately where that takes you. And yet, people in high places, people with the long list of degrees and high IQs, many years of learning, they're taking that position. Pluralism means I accept everybody. You're right, I'm right. I believe in killing you, you believe in killing me. We're both right. That sounds silly, but that's the absurdity of the view that everything is okay. And there's been some books written years ago, I'm okay, what's the next part of it? You're okay, which means nobody's wrong, everybody's right, and that's where we are. And we've raised a couple of generations on that false doctrine. And many of them, I hate to say it, are in the church. So we shouldn't be surprised when we see religion greatly influenced by these particular things. Secularism, pluralism, emotionalism, relativism, and subjectivism. It's very hard to find people who will say, I will judge by the facts in the case on the basis of the standard that governs that, whatever it is, case. You don't find that much in the ordinary people, among the ordinary people. When I say ordinary people, I mean just in dealing with normal things. You've all heard, and I've used this illustration before, it may have been quite a while. You've all heard of the whipping boy in Europe from many years ago. Well, what did that mean? It meant that you didn't touch the monarch nor the prince who is the heir apparent. So if he actually did something wrong as a child under the jurisdiction of his parents, not an adult, then there was somebody else that would be beat for it because you couldn't touch the person of the prince. And the idea was he'll see that the child is being beat for what you did and he'll learn from that. Oh, how horrible that is. Isn't that crazy? What's the lunatic? We've come a long way from that. No, we haven't. I'll show you how we have it. We'll get all stirred up. And I've said this before. You can take it for whatever it's worth. We get all stirred up and been out of shape if it's me and mine. But the same thing happened to you and yours. Well, I, that's what they should have got a long time ago. That's the subjectivism. That's the relativism. And we do that in so many things. When it comes to judging what we oppose, even what we stand for, who we oppose and who we support. We just don't see these things. We don't recognize that there's really few ways that the devil, as a roaring lion seeking whom may devour, can get us 
to violate God's will and die in that shape and be lost in the devil's hell forevermore. But he does a good job of it. He doesn't need that much. And that's what we studied about last week, too. In this country, we see people advocating freedom of religion. Well, we heard that a moment ago in the prayer. And that's a wonderful thing if you let me define freedom of religion like the Bible's talking about. When the scriptures are teaching us that we should pray for the freedom of religion, and that's my, my word here to fit in with what we were using. That is that the gospel may have free course is the way the Bible put it. That's right of way. You know, a free course is right of way. If you've got land that's hemmed in all sides of other people's land, the law says you have free course of your land. You have right of way. Well, we want right away for the gospel and for the church and the freedom to worship as the New Testament teaches us. Then we think about tolerance. Tolerance for all religion. That's, you know, you're not with it unless you're tolerant of all religions. I want you to notice this. I have a quote at home that came from somebody years ago. I used it one time. 50 years ago in a letter to an editor. I believe the fellow's name that quoted this or said it originally was a fellow by the name of Solomon Ash. I won't say that for sure, but it's written down if I want to look it up. Those who always talk about being tolerant are many times some of the most intolerant people on the face of the earth. You mark it down as a rule of thumb. Now, if you don't know what a rule of thumb is, I'm not going to explain it. As a guideline, so I did explain it, as a guideline, that when you hear somebody who is camped on something all of the time, even if it's a good thing, watch out. Because so many times they will violate it in their own lives. That's not always the case. But have you ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and given a close scrutinizing examination of the Pharisees? It's exactly what they did. And it's true, they bound their traditions to the exclusion of obeying the law of Moses, but that's the kind of people they were. And it binded them to so many other things. They couldn't, they, they couldn't or wouldn't, or however you want to say it, think logically with the law as the final authority for them at that time, approaching God through the law. And all of this has led to an attitude, a state of mind, a viewpoint, that it does not really matter what you believe. It doesn't really matter among religious people where you worship. And that even covers uh, the choice you have to believe in nothing and uh, attend really nowhere. There's a host of folks who have the attitude is that God is so loving and gracious, he's not going to condemn me no matter what. Now, used to, that used to characterize what is called the Unitarian Universalist Church. There used to be two churches, but they came together as one in the 60s, 1960s. But they're basically atheists. When Dr. Anthony Flew, at that time a world-renowned atheist, came to Denton to debate Brother Warren, he went to a barbecue on a Sunday, you know, whatever, whatever afternoon it was. I think it was a Saturday afternoon, whatever, at the Universalist Unitarian Church. <laughs> and you hear they're claiming to be a church. And so you got a lot of folks like that. They're not all Universalist Unitarian, but they hold basically the same idea. Now, if you don't believe it, just try to get into a discussion with people who think they're very religious. And you'll find out they want to make you out if you're advocating the authority of the New Testament, the straight and narrow way of truth. They'll make you out to be some kind of somebody beyond the right field. That's what they'll do. And there's always some interesting things to ask those people. One of them is this. Do you believe anybody's wrong anywhere, objectively wrong? Well, that kind of puts them on the spot because they really do. I promise you what they believe is wrong. They're hard against it. They're hard against it. 
So you can start asking some questions without even really getting into, here's what the Bible says, the Bible's the Word of God, we must do what it says, that shows them they don't even believe what they, what they say they do. And that's because they often, often the folks who talk about being so tolerant are very intolerant people. But now down to the Lord's church. Denomination started out in the fermented minds of men, and that's what governs them is the fermented minds of men and their commandments and doctrines, whether they're written down or not. None of them are acceptable to God. I found an interesting thing many years ago. wrote a little book about 30 years ago called Abilene Christian University, Ever-Changing, Never-Changing. I found this quote I wanted to put on the inside of it. This is from the Abilene Christian College Lectures. 1939, about time Kim was there, page 57. <laughs> That's not really true, we just check with him. It's close. <laughs> okay, this is from that lectureship book, 1939. That's a few years ago. What was it, 83? Um, here's what it says. And you ask me if there hasn't been a radical, radical, radical change in those people. They wouldn't allow this, what I'm about to read, to be said, thought of, or anything. And that would be true of most of the schools. Here's the quote. Denominationalism is the curse and bane of the age. So long as it remains to mislead and deceive the people, our work will not be finished. It is our duty fearlessly to unsheathe the sword of the Spirit, boldly go forth to battle, and plunge it into the very heart of sectarianism until, mangled and bleeding, it is left to die in its own shame. Guy Woods, his subject was Christianity in a changing world. That was concerned them in those days, didn't it? Christianity in the changing world. Well, it's page 57 if you want to look that up in that book. So these things have been troubling people who are determined to seek the old paths and to walk according to the authority of the New Testament long before everybody in this room discovered America. Yet that kind of comment would not be tolerated for one minute on any of the campuses operated by the brethren in those schools were all started thinking it would make God's people better and the church stronger and make Christian homes more Christian. But they don't think that anymore. If you look over at uh, Lipscomb University, they don't even put David Lipscomb anymore formally. It's Lipscomb University. They have in every kind of denominational person to carry on every kind of workshop you ever saw, and uh, they're not interested in that. They would think this is harsh. They would think it's narrow. They would think that it is unloving. It's exactly what they would think. If you were to take this quote, I challenge you to do so. Put it on a postcard without who said it, and maybe even with who said it and send it to the heads of all of the Bible departments and even maybe some of the preacher training schools and ask if they think this represents New Testament Christianity and the truth of the New Testament regarding churches that are not of the churches of Christ. See what you get. If you would be surprised, then you shouldn't be, but I wouldn't be surprised at all. If you got anything, it probably would be a mouthing around because they don't let their yay be yay and their nay nay like the Lord said. The sad part about it is when you go to ask anybody a true or false question. I am here in this assembly of the Spring Church of Christ today and I can define every one of those words in that statement. Some people would hesitate to say true. They might not want to say false. They don't know what to say because they've been fed the baloney I'm talking about. So all this hits the church. It certainly permeates the denominational world. 
So does it really matter if we assemble with others for religious purposes? Are there any real differences between churches? Well, among the denominations, I don't see really that there is. Why can't we just go to church of our choice? Isn't what I need for the church assembly more important than where I go to worship services? Well, we're answering things from the New Testament, New Testament of Jesus Christ, He who has all authority in heaven and on earth, an objective standard that's infallible because it was given to the writers by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It is truly the perfect law of liberty, James 1, 25. I think and have for a long time because of what the New Testament teaches about New Testament Christianity, just exactly what Brother Wood said in 1939 that I read to you a moment ago concerning denominationalism. Oh, we get all beside ourselves over uh, what's happening, and I'm not saying it's wrong to do so, in our country as far as politics and this, that, and the other is concerned. Well, how do you feel about the strong denominationalist? Whatever strong, I don't know how I can really use the word strong denominationalist together. Don't you know they're just as bound for torment as anybody, anybody, anywhere, atheist, infidel, whoever. They need the gospel. Now, in restoring ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity back 200 years ago, people in the denominations recognized that, and thus you had the great restoration work that started in this country. Nowadays, that's being repudiated, and they're trying to change the whole scope of why that ever started, and they're trying to say it was all because of unity, not to get back to the source of unity, the absolute objective standard of truth. But they knew John 12, 48, where Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And that bothered those people as it should everybody. Because how can we have one Bible? They had one Bible. We have all of these different churches with different names and creeds and organizations and way of salvation governed by all kinds of disciplines. And if you were a Presbyterian in 1820, if you were a Methodist in 1820, if you were a Baptist in 1820, you knew what that meant. You knew why you were different, and you thought you were right in the denomination. And so they uh, didn't agree with one another. They actually would debate one another. Well, then somebody came along and said, if there's one God, and if there's one Lord Jesus Christ, one Savior, and if there's one Bible and one New Testament, why are there many churches? So that started on the road to say if there is going to be unity like taught in the New Testament in which Jesus prayed for and Paul commanded, 1 Corinthians 1.10, there's going to have to be a standard of authority. Common sense says that. Give me a yard of cloth. Well, if you don't have an absolute objective standard, a yardstick, and it's accurate, you don't know what you're going to get. And so they recognize in matters spiritual that pertain to going to heaven or hell, yes, God has given us that perfect law of liberty, and we must measure all things according to it. But the church is eaten up with the stuff I'm talking about here. The denominational world has encouraged delusional uh, thinking when it comes to their churches. Uh, I don't blame many of them for feeling the way they do. They're sick and tired of liturgical worship and uncomfortable with all kinds of formality and what they call, quote, organized religion, unquote. You know, that's not the first time that happened. Now, I know everybody here has heard of the Methodist Church. Ever studied how it came to existence? John and Charles Wesley decided that the Church of England, which is the Episcopal Church in America, was too full. And they wanted to liven things up. That's how it started. They didn't seek to start the Methodist Church, but that's what it turned into because they wanted things all loose and 
happy go lucky and my grandmother died a Methodist and daddy said he would talk to, she would talk to him back in her young days which is now would have been over a hundred years ago and you know what Methodists were known as shouting Methodist because they carried on all sorts of informalities in their worship and much like Pentecostalism or the charismatic stuff that goes on today People get hurt by hypocrisy and self-righteousness. They see the inconsistency in the denominational world. They see that they're not much different from secular people who care not for God. They're infatuated with the contemporary cultural influence on denominational religion and fashion. Thus, they no longer attend worship assemblies regularly, and some not at all. And what has happened over the last 30 years has been the rise of the community church. That's what they formed. And so you see them all around here, basically built about around one person. But welcoming everybody in if you believe in God the Father and Jesus Christ and his need to save you. Rest of it, do as you please, come as you are. Now the sad part about this is our we brethren many times think well there's the way to settle all of our problems do and thus the idea some years ago of the core gospel came up what is the smallest entity that we have to fully agree on before we can be in fellowship with one another fundamentally in general although it gets different from this with some people they would say that if you believed and you've been baptized Nothing else really is binding on you that God requires of you to be faithful and go to heaven. Now, if you read after Carl Ketcher's side, who's been dead quite a number of years, his last years, many of them, were finally teaching this, and I have his commentary on this. Basically, he says the only thing that is the demarcation point is you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Beyond that, Nothing is binding as far as what you must do to be saved from your sins and be faithful to God. Well, that's the reason that emphasis has been whatsoever you do in word or in deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Colossians 3.17 And what does it mean to do things in the name of the Lord Jesus? It means by the authority of Jesus Christ. He who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, 18. That's what it means. It's not this business that we've been talking about. So all of this gets over into the church. Now a question, and this is where we will spend the remainder of our time. Why do Christians assemble? <coughs> Why do we assemble? Well, it can be for different reasons, but I think of this assembly on the first day of the week at this point. We can convene for various religious reasons, all of them authorized, but today we've convened to worship God in spirit and in truth. We have authority from the New Testament, rightly divided, to do so. But do all churches meet the biblical criteria? Well, of course they don't. Then all of them aren't alike, are they? Jesus said, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, well, he didn't just say it. He declared it adamantly. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, what's going to happen on the day of judgment? Well, I don't know everything. I don't know what it's like to experience such a thing. Someday I will, and you will too. But here's what he says. Many will say to me in that day, Lord. Well, they don't deny him not being Lord, do they? They know he's Lord. They admit he's Lord. They're confessing he's Lord right there on the day of judgment and right before him. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then you see the pluralistic disposition of deity yeah come right on in you believed in me that's all it took 
You may have been for aborting babies, but you believed in me. That's not what the Bible says. And then Jesus said, Will I profess unto them, I never knew you. They thought he did. But he didn't. I never knew you. Depart from me. What were they really doing? Ye that work iniquity. They didn't submit to his authority. They weren't concerned about his word being carried out in their lives. They didn't care about studying how to ascertain Bible authority. They didn't seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But they acknowledged him as Lord. And they said they had done all these things in his name. And that not only hits the denominations, every one of them, but it'll hit many members of the Lord's church. Because there wouldn't be a denomination when he said this for 1,500 years later. And he hadn't even established the church at the time that he said this. Can one attend the church of his choice? Well, of course he made us free moral agents. We're in this country. We can choose or not to. But that's not what he's talking about. We should add on to that and be pleasing to God. Being acceptable to God. We have developed in this country the pick-and-choose concept of Christianity, the cafeteria-type religion. That's what we have, and everybody thinks that's just the way it is. That's their concept of Christianity, denominationalism. You go to your church, I go to mine, and we all get to heaven together. It's been around a long time. Now it's flowed over into moral standards. I remember when I was a, a kid, and in my early years, on matters of morality that the Bible taught. Well, Baptists and members of the church pretty well stood the same way. I remember Baptist churches withdrawing from members who danced and who got drunk. I remember other churches that were strict doing that kind of thing. I don't ever remember any Methodists doing it, but it's like my grandmother said when she decided she ought to be buried in water, that that was really baptism. And I viewed one time, as I related to you, a person supposedly baptized, put in quotes. And she said, you tell your daddy there was a lot more water in that preacher's hand than it looked like. <clears throat> now, what does that tell you about deceiving yourself? Well, that's your grandmother, and you loved her. So, I did love her. Very close to her. Why should that change the Word of God? When people are lost, they're lost because they die in their sins. And sin is the transgression of the law. Going to heaven doesn't mean I have a good feeling toward you. It means you're faithful regardless of my feelings toward you. And that ought to be kept in mind. People are taught they can shop around for churches. It's like shopping for an automobile. They try to find one that fits what they think their needs are, and on you go. They don't really care what the Bible teaches on any topic. You say, well, that's terrible about the nominations. Brethren, I've lived too long as a preacher, and it would have to be no longer than the time I've been here, which is quite a while, to see many members who've come through the Spring Church. And when push came to shove and they had to make choices over their families, it didn't make a difference what the Bible says. They went with their family. It did not make any difference. That's such a sad situation. The focus is not on us. If you're faithful to God, the focus is on God. What pleases Him? More often than not, the question is, what can the church do for me? I think if you come across these people, maybe somebody asking a member of the church, and they say, what, what can y'all do for me type of question? May not take that same uh, format, but it would be the same thing. I think we ought to be asking them, what can you do to help the Spring Church of Christ live closer to the New Testament and be what the New Testament pattern says it ought to be? If you come here, are you going to hurt us or are you going to help us? Oh, you'll run them off. The gospel's pretty exclusive, folks. If you preach it as it is in the Bible, it was meant to keep certain people out and draw certain people in. 
And if they don't have an attitude of speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command, and I will obey. But they're going to come to simply try to say, uh, let, give me a gimme on this. You don't want them there. There's a little leavening, leaven, leaven up the whole lump. Well, there's a lot more. You know, you come to this worship period on the basis of the life you've been living over the past several days. And what you get out of worshiping God in spirit and in truth is going to depend upon how you're living for the Lord 24-7. And if this is the only time you're going to give much attention to what goes on, then you're going to go right back to the old stuff you were doing when you leave this assembly. Besides that, and I'll close with this, because this characterizes the Christian from the core out. Why do we assemble to worship God? We are commanded to do so, and we live to obey His commandments. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And read the verse before it. Verse 24 says we're to provoke one another unto love and good works. Well, they can't be meritorious works. It must be works of obedience just like this sermon is designed to do in your life. Provoke you to be obedient to God. I wish I could get some brethren throughout the churches of Christ to be as interested and involved and stirred up over things pertaining to the kingdom of the living God, a kingdom that cannot be shaken and will be here long after this old world's long gone. And everything material ceased as they are about politics. Now, if you're one of those that can't really get concerned about the Lord's church and its work and where your membership is is where you're going to do most of your work, but you're concerned about job and you're concerned about what's going on out here in society, I close with this. There's nothing going on out there in the world that hasn't been going on in the world since the devil became the prince of this world. And you knew that if you knew your Bible because he's a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour through the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes of pride of life. Now what occupies your time? What takes up your time in prayer? What hinders you from studying your Bible and putting the Lord first? Well, when it all said and done, I am the one who will hinder me from being all God says I ought to be. And it's true of everybody else. It's the reason at the end of time, standing before Jesus in judgment, I will give an account of the deeds done in my body, whether good or bad. And so will everybody else. If you need to obey the gospel, please believe that Christ is the Son of God. Confess your faith in Christ after repenting of your sins and be baptized into him for the remission of sins. As a child of God, does it make any difference about the assembly of the saints and the life you live in the church and the worshiping of God? If you've sinned, we beg you to repent. Come confessing him and we'll pray with you and for you. And please come to the Lord while we stand and sing.